welcome to my podcast and my YouTube channel. Today I have a colleague with me. She's a therapist. She's been working for 11 years, but that's not what brought her here. Actually, uh, she came through the Stability Network. I have talked about it in the past, but they have been kind enough to send a few people to share their stories. And that's what they do. They openly talk about mental health struggles, some of them with suicidal ideation or loss of someone to suicide, but these are people who got together and they get trained in public speaking and they decided to help bring awareness to mental health. So thank you Stability Network for sending me, sending me these wonderful people to talk on my show. And Megan, I have to thank Megan because she's the one who's been contacting you and sending you to me. So first of all, tell me about the experience. I mean, what is the Stability Network? How does it work? And you, you were telling me a few minutes ago that it was something that you dreamt of all your life. You wish you had created it, huh? It, it really was. Um, the Stability Network is a network of, we, we're called Stability Leaders. And the mission really is to to share our stories, um, to be living proof that, that we can thrive living with mental health conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and for you, of course, uh, you do that also in your work because you have clients and do you openly talk about your struggles in therapy with your patients? I do, I use self-disclosure as a therapy, therapeutic tool um, when it's appropriate, of course. When I know that it's gonna not be about me and it's gonna help the client um, with their own journey. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's very helpful. Uh, I do it sometimes too, but uh, we were talking before we started recording that that's the power of support groups, right? When you Absolutely. look at, when you hear the story, you say, okay, she gets me. Of course, it's never the same story. Struggles are different, but in a way you connect with the pain too, and, and you know where they've been. Yeah. I think it's really about seeing ourselves reflected in other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Jess, I don't think I even introduced you. Sorry. Did I say your name? I don't think you so. You did not. My well, name is okay. Jess. So I'm doing that now. That's the first. Jess Fritz. <laughs> that's, that's the name of my guest today. Sorry <laughs> about that. I want to focus, uh, you know, I was reading the, the page that you sent me with the questions and answers and a little bit of your background. And I was struck by how long you've been dealing with different kinds of treatments. And I actually, it was kind of a, a coincidence if you will ever be, believe in those. But I was listening, uh, it was two days ago, I was listening to a podcast, it's called Which Way? It's actually by two people that I interviewed for my podcast. And if the listener wants to listen, it's the episode number 56. One of the most amazing stories of resilience that I've heard in my life. This podcast is hosted by Jen and Sherry Simmons. And they were interviewing, um, I, be I believe it was the, Ed, was it the director? I think it was the director of a new documentary called, called Medicating Normal. Have you seen it? I haven't. It sounds yeah, really so it's, it's a new one. I, they actually have a web page. I believe it's medicatingnormal.org or .com. Just look it up and you'll find document. It's a documentary. And they were interviewing them. And they what they do is they raise awareness about medication and how you really have to ask questions to your doctors and you have to question yourself, is this really making me better or worse? Or am I really sick or is it the medication that's making me sick? So that's, that's the question they raise. And, and they have actually one of the stories that I just, I was dumbfounded by that. She was this one woman they follow many different stories, but this woman who was taken at some point in her life, 20 different medications. I mean, how can yeah. you not be sick if you're taking 20 medications? So when I was reading your story, I said, that's the focus, that, that's something that I really would love to hear you on, because I know, and I'm just going to briefly give your uh, background on this. You took psychotropic medications for over two, two decades, over, right? 20 yep. something mm -hmm. years. 
you have been hospitalized more than 18 times. You've yeah. been through electroconvulsive therapy as well, all kinds of treatments. So you have the background and I really want to help my listener those who are taking medication and maybe you need to change your medication and I'm not saying please do not get off it because we know that's very dangerous always talk to your doctor but it needs to be questioned and you were you were one of those people who questioned it and now you've been free of medication for a while so let's well, start with until that. the pandemic <laughs> oh yeah it was a yeah. brief moment but no I'm I'm so happy you brought up this topic. I'm fascinated by it. I, I want to write about it. I want to do something with it. We need to question um, the experts, the professionals that are treating us. And I, I don't want to sound like I'm being, I don't questioning authority or I, I work in the system as well, right? So it's kind mm -hmm. of, it's odd, but I at such a young age was thrown into it and just told that I needed these medications. And my mom didn't question it. And I was too young to question it. And then they just kept being piled on, piled on. And there were so many at one time, it wasn't clear what was doing what, and were they helping? Were they, were they making it worse? Um, I was definitely told I was sick from a very early age and it, it kind of just didn't stop for 20 years. Wow. It yeah, and, and as, as the title of this documentary says, Medicating Normal, you had been uh, sexually abused at a very early age. You were a child. You started taking medication at, what, 12, when you were 12 yeah. years old? And probably because you were having a normal reaction after that trauma, right? But right. that's what we do. We medicate, we diagnose normal, we medicate normal. And then we, when we start having symptoms, you medicate the symptoms and you pile up, as you said. Right. But it's, it, you and I both probably know a trauma informed perspective is what needs to be done. It's about changing the language. They were asking what's wrong with you when I was, you know, young and acting out and having behavioral issues instead of asking what happened to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very powerful. Yeah, it's completely different, right? Yeah. Don't medicate the, the behavior, but let's find out what's behind it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you see it a lot in your in your office? I have, over depending on where I'm working, I've worked in hospitals, I've worked in crisis centers, so that's more like the, the medical side of things where medication is, is highly used. Um, and then I've worked in, in different places where it's, it's not done the same way. There's just different ways to go about treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, you, one of the, th this, the things you said was that I was, I was raised to believe that I was sick and that recovery was not possible. Was that something that you were told by doctors or something doctors, that you internalized? Yeah. Doctors. I got it from psychiatrists. And I got it from psychiatric nurses on, you know, um, inpatient psych units a lot. I had big dreams of where I wanted to go. And they, they would literally look me in the face and tell me that I was not going to become anything in my life because I was, I needed to be institutionalized. I was told that at a young age, even in college, um, I, I continued to be told that even though I was a high caliber scholarship athlete at a, at a big university and still being told that I, you know, I belonged contained and locked away, away from society. Oh my God. They told you that? Yeah. And you've had different kinds also of, of diagnosis. What, what were they? Just mention a few. That, that's a fascinating thing to me as well. I, um, I mean, my, my first one was bipolar disorder. That was right out of the gate at 12, I was put on a medication for bipolar disorder. And it has stuck with me throughout the years, but from one psychiatrist to the next, it, it can change pretty drastically. But um, I mean, the two that have always stuck were bipolar disorder and borderline personality disorder. Um, but I like to call that one complex post-traumatic stress disorder because um, it's really a trauma disorder. It came from years and years of, of you know chronic trauma. Mm -hmm. And how did you, when, when was the moment when you, you said, okay, maybe, maybe I need to, to look at this again and question? 
Was it something you felt or something that you were doing at the time, maybe self-destructive behavior? Um, I was always fighting it. And I think that was actually hurting me. I was a mm -hmm. fighter. I, I, I don't know. I was always looking for a quick fix. I think that was mm -hmm. deterring me from getting the right help. Um, I, I was honestly chronically suicidal for 20 years. It was the first thought in my head and the last thought in my head. And that all stopped when I finally got the right treatment. And I want to talk about that because I think there was stabilizing crises, which was never the right treatment for me, but it kept me safe. And that was really mm -hmm. important at the time. Mm -hmm. And then there was actual hard work that I needed to be ready to put in to like move forward and progress and heal and learn things. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. Well, the first one is basically what hospitalization does, right? When you have someone in, of course, emergency or suicide or attempted suicide, we take them to a hospital, which is the right thing to do when it's an emergency. But what they do is they stabilize you and they send you back to mm -hmm. with no skills, right? Yeah. But I like to say, I think the people around me were really trigger happy with 911. And then I would, you know, experience the police coming and a pretty big heated situation and was brought in and handcuffed to the hospital every time. And I, I, I was often not actively suicidal. It was this chronic suicidal ideation where I just didn't feel well. Um, you know, and there was a lot of parasuicidal behavior or non-suicidal self-injurious behavior where I was, I was self-harming a lot. And that was scary. Mm -hmm. And I get that now. That's a scary thing. If you have a loved one or anybody, you know, who's engaging in that behavior, it's terrifying. And, but it was, it was a coping skill for me, not a good one, but so people were really quick to put me in the hospital to contain that behavior rather than really looking at what I needed. Mm -hmm. What about electroconvulsive therapy? You said that that was very helpful and I, I would love to hear you because we still have that horrible images of movies of people having shocks and, and it's not like that anymore. Of course, now it's, it's very different. And I have heard that in some cases, it's really, really helpful. And it's, it sounds like it was helpful to you. I would say it saved my life. Um, when I had it, I had two different rounds at two different places um, at a total of 38 treatments. Um, and it is very different. It's, it's as I think it's humane. Um, you're put under general anesthesia. So you're not even aware of, of what's going on. It, it was mm -hmm. scary the first couple of times. And then I just got really used to it. Um, I got to know the people who were coming in on the same days. And it was almost like, I hate to say it, it was almost a factory of just going through the people who needed it, but um, it was very, very helpful. I, I achieved some stability for several years after that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, gl I'm glad you talked about that because as I said, uh, that's not what we think about electro. It's the, something in the past that should stay there. And we know, we know from research and we know that no, it really, really helps sometimes in, in cases of, for example, depression that does, if you don't respond to medication, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm glad it helped you. So tell me about uh, what was the turning point for you? You said that there were two treatments that really, that's, those are the treatments that you came out of with skills to actually deal and, and, and look at your trauma and process it. Yeah, it, um, leading up to it, it, it's actually a blessing in disguise. I had developed um, substance use disorders and I'd always categorized myself as living with mental health conditions and not in the other category, you know, the co-occurring of, of living with any substance use. And I hadn't really been. And then in, in one year, in a matter of one year, it became really unmanageable. I was using alcohol and cocaine and that only negatively impacted my mental health, but I was in complete denial and I was very ashamed, especially since I was a mental health provider. Um, and that led to the, the most serious suicide attempt I've had in my life, which there have been multiple, but it was almost two years ago. It was May 15th, 2019. I took a very lethal overdose and ended up in the ICU. Um, they had to save my life. And 
that moment, we, I was ready to have an honest conversation about what I really needed. And because there was obviously substance use involved, I was able to go off to treatment where I, it, it wasn't stabilization. It was go live here for two months and be with other people and get well. And so I packed a bag and was picked up and left my house and my life um, for two months. And it, it did start as kind of treatment for a substance use disorder, but then I, I was also getting mental health treatment at the same time. And I think what was really different about that was the providers were part of it. Like in the hospital, it was always us versus them. Whereas in, in these treatment programs, like we were all in it together and we were residents, not patients. We were wearing our normal clothes. We were doing things that were very healing, like doing yoga and all this therapeutic stuff that just felt really good. Um, I just felt seen and heard for the first time in my life. And I saw myself reflected in others. And I think that's like we were speaking in the beginning that really makes a difference. Mm -hmm. It sounds like before, especially when you talk about uh, emergency had been hospitalized, that was a different situation. It, it's someone trying to contain you. It's not someone trying to listen to you, which is very different. Yeah. I mean, I was still not able to leave this place, but it, it was just different. They were really listening. They were really seeing me. They were not trying to rush me out of there. I was doing the homework. I was doing the work I wanted to. I saw hope for the first time in my life. That's what I was missing for all those years. Um, the hospital wasn't a very hopeful place. I didn't see a future. And this, this place, I went to two different places, but one after the next, um, I finally saw a future and it looked really bright and I got really excited. And then slowly the suicidal ideation just disappeared and it hasn't ever come back in almost two years. Wow, wow, that's, that really brings, <clears throat> brings hope and, and I'm, I'm glad you're saying that. When you, when you say I did the work, I was doing the work, what does that mean? But just, just so my listener who have, well, they haven't been there but maybe they're thinking about it, what does that mean, doing the work? it was honestly like school. Um, we had a schedule every single day that, like I said, there was fun things mixed in or, or really good things for our bodies. Um, but there was a lot of writing and then sharing our writing and a lot of groups and a lot of talking and just really, I, I finally got honest with myself and looked at myself. Um, and I, yeah, I just, my, the whole perspective of, my story changed of, I don't know, like I was talking in the beginning, I kind of was blaming the system. I stopped doing that. I stopped finding reasons why this, this was my life and this is what I had to show for it. And I just started living and thriving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what about the medication? I mean, how did you uh, did you go to back to your doctors and said, okay, maybe we should lower the dose or I, I need to be off of some of the, how did that work? How did you do the it medication part? It was actually part? a beautiful process in those treatment programs where these doctors didn't believe that I was as sick as I had been told all my life. They, um, they started weaning me off of medications. They started taking me off of things I didn't need. They wanted me on as few as I could possibly need and still, you know, function and, and live well. And that, that was really powerful to me. Um, some, these psychiatrists spoke differently than the ones I was used to hearing. They, they said, Jess, you know, you're not, you're not this person you think you are. Um, you really just, you have this rage and this fire in you and you just need to put it to good use. Like you don't need, you're not sick. You don't, you know, they almost could see that I wanted to wear that label as a way to explain all the things that had happened to me. Well, it does make a difference, doesn't it? When you, when you have someone who is trauma informed, who looks at you and sees the person, not the disease and the symptoms. Yeah. 
I'm sure you bring that. Did that change the way that you work? It was always how I was working, but I was easily influenced by um, more experienced and seasoned providers around me and kind of easily bought into that. And I think after this experience, I, it's very hard for me to waver now where it's, it's person first, you know, disease and symptoms second, you know. Tell me some of the skills that you learned during these programs that you brought into your life. And you know that now, and you mentioned, of course, COVID has made everything harder for everyone. And I'm sure it's, it's has, it has had a toll on you. But tell me um, some of the skills that you, you know, the changes you made in your life, because your life, after you got out, I'm sure that your life had to be redone, yeah. right? It did. Um, I got back to the basics and we see a lot of articles about this and we, it kind of gets old about how important the basics are, but they are, um, you know, just the, the sleep, eating, exercising, like that stuff. But I was able to only focus on that in treatment and, and realize that I could easily do it. I didn't feel like I could do stuff like that, like get eight hours of sleep and eat well and exercise. It just didn't make sense to me that it could practically fit into my life. Um, and then there was a lot of skill learning. Um, dialectical behavioral therapy was the one that I needed. And that's really to learn how to regulate my emotions, tolerate the stress, effectively communicate with people. I needed all of those things desperately. Uh, I was quick to feel things and not know what to do with them. And now I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me some of the skills, because I, I always want to, at least in the end, to teach my audience something, something new, some of the skills that you've learned, especially with the self-regulation. Yeah, well, my favorite one that I still use and that I teach clients to use and when I first was walked through it with um, the professionals at, at my second treatment center, I was like, there's no way this is going to do anything. And it sounds kind of um, unreal to me, but it's just, it's a simple ice dive, which was they, they grabbed a, a bowl and filled it with ice and then filled it with water and had me shove my face in it. But they were there wow. doing it with me and walking me through it. And it felt very healing and therapeutic. And it, 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 what it does is provoke a physiological response in your body and it, it lowers your blood pressure, lowers your heart rate because your body thinks it's going into hypothermia. So it literally just kind of shocks your system into calming down. And when, when I did it, I was, I didn't want to come out of the ice. It felt so good. You can do the same thing, like taking a cold shower um, or, you know, running out into some snow or something, but it'll do the same thing. It'll just quickly calm you down. I, did, I hadn't heard about this one. I've, I've heard about the one, the mindfulness one, that you hold uh, the ice cube for the, fir the first time. And I actually listened to a, thera a therapist was doing this live and she, she, you grab the, the ice cube and you, you have to time it to see how long you, because it hurts, right? Yeah. And the first time she did it was like 35 seconds. She had to let go. And then the second one, that's when the mindfulness comes in. You are supposed to actually pay attention to the pain, pay attention to how it feels in your hand and uh, the fingers, which one gets numb, which one does. So it's, it's a mindfulness and me being along, going along with it. And the second time when she did it, it was a minute and a half. So three times longer, just because you're not just running away from it. You don't want to just uh -huh. get rid of it, but you actually try to experience that. But I hadn't heard about this one that you put your whole face and shock your body into, okay, yeah. calm down, calm down, lady. <laughs> <laughs> and mindfulness in general is pretty amazing. I, I simplify it with clients um, just to utilize the five senses, right? Engage any one of your senses and that, and you're doing mindfulness. Because mindfulness is this big word that's used a lot and, and we think it means meditating for 30 minutes quietly by ourselves and it doesn't have to be that. Like it can just be putting on a candle and listening to some music, anything that engages the five senses. Yeah, yeah. I like that you say that because still, I think there is, as you said, I think mindfulness, the word has been overused 
and a lot connected with uh, meditation. If you think about this person at the top of a mountain for eight days meditating, and that's not what it is. <laughs> I actually, I have a little book of mindfulness and it gives you one exercise a day. So it's a very simple thing. I mean, today you can pay attention to your right hand, pay attention to everything your right hand, because you, we don't realize all these things we do, right? The senses every day mm -hmm. without noticing, like brushing your teeth or pay attention to the amount of work your right hand does every day. So one day is to pay attention to that. So it's like daily exercise and, it, and it's really helpful. Because mindful, and when we think about anxiety, and now with COVID, I'm sure you see a lot of that. That's mainly all, most of my clients, that's what they have now, it's anxiety. And anxiety is about future, it's fearing some, something that might happen, right? All these creations that we have, these thoughts, and, and we believe it's going to happen, and that's what mindfulness helps with, brings you back to, to now. That, that's yeah. what mindfulness is. And as you said, it's beautiful what you said. It's just think about your senses, but be present. And, be and, present. Yeah, be present. Yeah, because it's hard. so automatic. I mean, anxiety, mm -hmm. those automatic thought processes that occur. Um, you know, anxiety, I like to think of anxiety being from the future, which hasn't happened yet. Depression comes from the past. Neither one of those are we in right now. And so mm -hmm. people are missing out on the present. So mindfulness really does bring us right into the here and now. Mm -hmm. How have you been um, dealing with COVID? Is it, you said it's been quite triggering, huh? It has, it's triggered those years where I used to experience depressive states, um, mm -hmm. where I, I would uh, be in my bed, be in my room for weeks at a time. And mm -hmm. now I'm kind of doing that electively, although anxiety has <laughs> kicked in. I'm, I'm rather uh, terrified of the virus and becoming sick. So yeah. I'm in my house a lot and not going out. And that, of course, has taken away the usual outlets, the self-care outlets, being outside in the sun, moving my body, engaging with others. Um, so those things, you know, not having those things has, has been difficult. Yeah. How you how you do? I doing a lot of ice, no face in the ice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of a lot of baths. I got so into baths in the last year with with bath bombs and Epsom salts and candles, like yes. just soaking in a bath for an hour, and then dogs. Like I could not have done this without my dogs. Oh my the goodness! Pets, you know, I just I just interviewed someone who said I could not have done this without my cat. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we have a full yes. house of animals, so yeah. that's been really helpful. Well, I am glad to see how you're doing, and what are the goals for the future? I know that you're newly newly married, right? You just got married. Yeah, it's, yeah and it's, it's funny you wrote enough. you wrote uh, I have uh, I'm newly married, and I have my fur dealing with my you you wrote fur babies, and I I read four babies. And I said, oh, my God, how can she have four babies? <laughs> and then I went no. back to, oh, fur. Oh, okay. My fur babies. <laughs> yeah. We've just gotten more and more um, yeah. as this last year has gone by. Um, goals, I want to get back to in-person work. I want to. Mm, I know. Yeah. It's not the of, same, is it? No. It's not. And I was new. I'm new to the town I'm in. And it was only months before this hit. So I want to get out into the community, get to know the community, see where I can help the community, just kind of see where I'm at in the world, because yes. I don't really know. Yeah. Well, to end, what would you say to someone who, who is now listening to you and say, wow, I have all this diagnosis too. I'm taking all these medications too. How can they start this process? Because I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea that I, we're saying stop medication. But I yeah. mean, what is, what is a, a healthy way of starting to, you know, question it? That's a great question. I think just, no, it's not, we, we don't want anyone to just abruptly stop their medication. I think it's about beginning a dialogue with providers. Um, I, I just got lucky to finally end up with the right providers who were willing to listen to me and see something different. You know, the diagnosis wasn't so important. Um, but it, it, I think it is healthy to question 
It is because the list of diagnoses I've been given are so is so long, and it's not clear what I what 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 I really am. It's not an exact science. It's not a hard science. It's a soft science. You know, psychology and that book that we use. It's really just um, being an observer and subjectively figuring out what somebody's experiencing. So, I mean, that alone um, should cause question. I think people should question things. Mm -hmm. And if you don't feel that you're being listened to, find another provider, right? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I definitely encourage therapist shopping, always. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> therapy shopping. It has to be a good <laughs> fit. Yeah, we, we, it's one of the things that uh, on, on this podcast, I think it was Sherry who asked the director, she said, uh, yeah, we, no, the director actually mentioned, we spend hours on Amazon when we're buying something, reading reviews. We don't do that with doctors. We don't do that with therapists. We should, right? Yeah. Or medication, we just take it. Yeah. Yeah, so you're right, and I, I want one of one of the things that uh, also in this video. I'm I haven't seen I haven't seen the documentary, but I'm really interested in 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 watching it because I think they're just circulating online and in some places now. But she says normal has been confused with comfortable. Hmm. I think that's great, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. about being comfortable. If you're uncomfortable, take a pill. I like that. Um, yeah, I, I loved when she said that. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. So thank you, Jess. Thank you for being here thank with us. Thank you so us. much for having me. Thank you. And thank you to Stability Network and Megan. Thank you.